For centuries, the British Army has worn the famous red coat, from the heights of Abraham near Quebec to the scorching plains of Zululand, from the battlefield of Waterloo to the Crimea. The red coat has been the symbol of the British Army. But in all honesty, why did they choose red? Let's take a look. For centuries, the British Army and Royal Marines were clothed in the famous red coat. But even to this day, we still can't let our history go, and we still wear the red coat at special events, such as the Trooping of the King's Colour, the opening of Parliament, and patrolling the Tower of London. Now armies have worn the colour red since, well, since humans have been fighting and learnt how to produce red as a dye. For example, the Romans, it seems, in particular, were keen on red as a martial colour. But looking at more modern times, who started it all off? I think we can make the argument that it was Henry VIII who began this country's real connection with the red coat. He took the yeomen of the guard who had been formed under his father, Henry VII, and changed their uniform. Gone was his father's livery of white and green, and replaced it with a more regal colour, red. These men were obviously an impressive unit, armed with their wickedly sharp halberds. The Venetian ambassador visited Henry VIII at his Richmond Palace in 1515 and recorded, We were conducted to the presence through sundry chambers, all hung with most beautiful tapestry, figured in gold and silver and in silk. Passing down the ranks of the red-coated bodyguard, which consists of 300 halberdiers in silver breastplates and pikes in their hands, and by God, they were all as big as giants, so that the display was very grand. The following year, 1520, Henry VIII commanded the captain of the guard, Sir Henry Mermet, to select 200 of his tallest men to accompany the king to his meeting with Francis I, King of France, at the field of the Cloth of Gold. 100 yeomen were to be mounted on suitable horses. Moving on from Bluff King Howe, a century and a bit later, we start getting to the real birth of the Redcoat and its association with the English and later the British Army. The gentlemen pensioners of James I, now the gentlemen at arms, had worn red with yellow feathers. At Edge Hill, the first battle of the Civil War, the King's lifeguard of Charles I had worn redcoats, but so at least two parliamentary regiments as well. However, None of these examples constituted the national uniform that the red coat was later to become. The English civil wars were the turning point. In relation to the population of Britain, it was the deadliest war ever fought by these islands. Approximately 7% of the population perished due to combat, disease and starvation. But as the war ground on, desperate and radical changes were needed, and one of these was made by Parliament in 1645. After two years of attritional back-and-forth war, Parliament decided that to win this war, what was needed was a professional, centrally funded, centrally supplied and centrally led army. An army that was not tied to any county or region, and an army that was uniformly equipped and clothed. Behold, the new model army. Despite the war going slowly in Parliament's direction, money was still tight, and so the colour of the coat was of paramount importance. And here is the key reason that the new model army, and therefore future British armies, were red. And it may not be the most exciting reason, because it was cheap. As always, the government would buy from the lowest bidder, and it so happened here. Madder route was the cheapest on the market in those days. Cloth from Flanders was the place to go. So the army of Parliament was dressed in red, because that was the lowest cost. Army uniforms had been anything but uniform throughout the war. In 1642, when the war flared up, there were very few units with proper uniforms, and it was up to individual colonels to clothe their regiments. So if a colonel wanted a regiment in green coats, then in green coats they would be in. But this would lead to an army potentially looking like a great multicoloured patchwork quilt. This could and did lead to great confusion on a battlefield. How could you tell whether that regiment in blue was on your side, if you had blue regiments in your army? What with the amount of smoke on a 17th century battlefield, there were literally, unfortunately, blue-on-blue blue incidents. Armies did try and make sure their soldiers knew who was on their side. Systems such as field signs like paper in the hat band, or foliage stuffed into the hat. Phrases or call signs were also tried. But in the heat of battle, with so much noise, smoke and chaos all around, 
these attempts were only ever going to be stop gaps. What was needed was an army to look all the same. In other words, to have the same uniform. Red dye was cheap and easy to produce from madder root, which gave the coat colour of Venetian red. A contemporary comment on the new model army, dated the 7th of May 1645, stated that The men are red coats all. The whole army only are distinguished by the several facings of their coats. The facings, which consisted of cuffs and linings, were to differentiate between regiments whilst maintaining the red coat as the colour for the National Army. It is worth mentioning that the red coat as a colour of coat was not the only famous colour in the English Civil Wars. Other colours were to win lasting fame or infamy, dependent on how you view the war. Prince Rupert's blue coats were a famous regiment throughout the war, and the tragic end of Newcastle's white coats and their heroic stand at the end of the Battle of Marston Moor is a tale of tragedy and heroism. The first recognised battle where British soldiers wore the red coat abroad was the Battle of the Dunes in 1658. A combined French and British force defeated a Spanish army near the beaches of Dunkirk. Following the English Civil Wars and the Republic under Cromwell, Charles II was restored to the throne in 1660. The restored monarchy and the tiny standing army carried on supplying red uniforms for the same reason. They were cheaper. As the years passed, what began as a mere matter of practicality became a proud tradition. British soldiers began winning all over the world, creating an empire wearing red uniforms. It was also during Charles II's reign that the Royal Marines were born. Their first title was the Duke of York's and Albany's Maritime Regiment of Foot, or Admiral's Regiment. The name Marines first appeared in the records in 1672, and in 1802 they were titled the Royal Marines by King George III. By the time of the Napoleonic Wars, they would wear a red coat like their land-based comrades. But their first uniform was not red, more of a... well... it was yellow. The British Army carried on with a now distinctive red coat during the War of Spanish Succession, where the Duke of Marlborough, Winston Churchill's great ancestor, would become internationally famous for his martial endeavours. The Seven Years' War was where Britain gained ownership of lands such as Canada, large parts of India, Nova Scotia and Gibraltar. It was in this war where the fame of the Redcoat would be linked to the great General James Wolfe, the ascent of the Heights of Abraham, and the finest volley ever fired at the Battle of Quebec. And also in the searing heats of India, where Robert Clive faced huge tribal armies with their French allies and elephants. The 1770s saw the Redcoat embroiled in the War of American Independence, which resulted in the disastrous loss of the American colonies. Following hot on the heels of this far-off war came the wars against France and then Napoleon. It was here that the British army was welded eventually under the Duke of Wellington into one of the most famous fighting machines ever created. The Redcoat would march from Portugal, through Spain, France and finally to beat Napoleon at Waterloo in Belgium. The 19th century would see the British Redcoat fight abroad as well as expand the British Empire to the Cape of Good Hope, Zululand, the Crimea, New Zealand and the Far East. The British have always taken great pride in their empire, but it is to be remembered this was at the expense of local inhabitants and much blood was spilled and violence brought upon peaceful nations. The Redcoat in the Age of Empire, like the War of American Independence, was all too often seen as an oppressor and ravager of peoples. In the War of American Independence, the Redcoats were often called Bloody Backs. Now, we have been talking about red in Redcoats, but in the British Army of the 1700s and the first half of the 1800s, the Redcoat was more usually referred to as a Brick Red and was the product of madder dyes. This dye, because it was cheap, was not particularly colour fast and tended to fade or run with exposure to ultraviolet rays of the sun and wet weather. The original shade may have been crimson, but rapidly became a light, dull red, brick red, or reddish brown. In diaries written during the Waterloo campaign of 1815, it was noted that soldiers' coats had faded from a deep red to a much lighter brick red because of having to march and bivouac in driving rain as Wellington's army concentrated at Waterloo to face Napoleon. But not only had the colours run, but the madder dyes had also stained the white belt equipment 
to a pinkish colour. Prior to 1707, colonels of regiments made their own arrangements for the manufacture of uniforms under their command. This ended when a royal warrant on the 16th of January 1707 established a board of general officers to regulate the clothing of the army. Uniforms supplied were to conform to the sealed pattern agreed by the board. A more expensive red was actual crimson and was normally used in the British Army for sergeants' coats, the facing colour of some regiments, and the sashes of sergeants and officers. It was usually made from the Kermes insect, a parasite found on Kermes oak. It was more expensive, hence it was limited in its application. Finally, there was scarlet, the much more brilliant reddish-orange used in the coats of army officers. Officers purchased their own uniforms and did not have to rely on government issue. Consequently, a scarlet coat was a symbol of rank, privilege and authority. Like crimson, scarlet was produced from cochineal and obtained from parasitic insects on cactus in the New World. It differed in producing much more brilliant dye than the related Old World and Asian varieties. And now, the myths of why the British wore the red coat. Some ideas are sensible, whilst others, well, I'll leave up to you. The first myth is the British wore red because from a distance it blurred men together, making it difficult for an enemy to count how many men were there. I cannot see why red would be so different to any other colour in this case. At the time the red coat was being implemented for the new model army, armies would draw up in full battle array and not attempt to conceal men behind ridges, such as the Duke of Wellington would do about 150 years later. On top of this, each company, not just every regiment, every company would have its own colour. A six-foot colour square flag twirled and held by an ensign. With all this, it is difficult to see why choosing a colour coat to conceal numbers would be a sensible suggestion. The other myth, which seems very unlikely and has no real basis in fact, that red was used to conceal wounds and blood. Blood does in fact show on red clothing as a black stain, and as many of the uniforms would have been brick coloured, faded or sun bleached, a wound would show up all too clearly. Another argument against this theory is the fact that the British soldier may have worn a red coat, but in the Seven Years' War, the Napoleonic Wars and later in the 19th century, the British would wear white breeches, a colour that would certainly show up blood. So it seems the red coat that made the British army famous across the globe came about because it was cheap. Before the days of camouflage and concealment, the red coat, although offering a vivid target, could also allow you to see friendly units in the smoke-filled battlefield of the pike and shot, and later the horse and musket era. But the red coat was not to last, as the accuracy and rapidity of firepower forced armies to change tactics and ultimately uniforms. The turning point for the British army was the Boer Wars at the end of the 19th century, a war that saw the British soldier standing out like a sore thumb on the sandy-coloured landscape of South Africa. The new uniform was cooler, more comfortable, and made the British soldier less of a target. The days of the redcoat on the battlefield were over. But off the battlefield, the redcoat and its glorious history lives on. <laughs>